Today we're going to finish up chapter two, uh, go over free fall acceleration, and um, make sense of some graphical integration techniques. All right, so in the cases that we're talking about, we're talking about objects that are close to the Earth's surface, um, and they have no external forces acting on them except for their weight. Um, so we're not talking about any air resistance um, or anything like that. All right, so we're going to use, um, for the acceleration model, we're going to replace A with G. So anytime you had an equation, um, such as our kinematic equations like this, oops, we're going to replace um, the A with a negative G. And that's going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. This is a number that you will certainly not forget by the end of the course. Um, so in a vacuum, a feather and an apple are going to fall at the same rate. So at the same altitude, um, close to the Earth's surface, you're going to have all objects falling at the same rate no matter how heavy they are. All right, so let's just start off with an example problem. Um, so a pitcher tosses a ball straight up along the y-axis with its initial speed of 12 meters a second. All right, so oops, it's going straight up. It has a speed of 12 meters a second. How long does it take the ball to reach its maximum height? So we're trying to find this h value. Um, when we're talking about anything in the y direction, we can just call that y. So before we had x, now we're just going to have a delta y instead. All right, so once the ball leaves the pitcher and before it returns to his hand, its acceleration is in free fall. So anytime an object is not being pushed or pulled or, or modified by any other forces, it's going to be in free fall. Um, and in the y direction, it's always going to have this negative g acceleration right here, so negative 9.8 meters a second squared. Now at the max height, the velocity is going to be zero because you throw something up, it's going to go straight up, and then it's going to slow down, slow down, slow down, and then stop up at the top, and then it's going to come back down. All right, so that's what it's showing here. Your uh, velocity at the highest point is going to be zero. All right, so we can use the kinematic equations just like we did uh, previously in problems, um, but instead, again, of, of x, we're going to use the y here, um, and then instead of a, we're going to use our negative g. All right, so uh, we need to find an equation that suits our needs, that has all the uh, variables that we need. All right, so we're going to start with this equation, and this equation is listed for us like this. So it's just rearranged uh, into this form because we want to solve for t. All right, so again, we had the final velocity, which was zero, because that was at the top of the ball. Now we're subtracting off its initial velocity, which is 12 meters a second. That's what we threw it up at. And then dividing by its acceleration. Again, don't forget that negative sign in front of the acceleration. We're always going to say that the positive y direction is up, oops, and that the negative y direction is down. All right, so we get an answer of 1.2 seconds. Uh, part B is what is the ball's maximum height after it after its release point? So at what height does it get up to? What y value? So we're trying to find y. Um, so the equation that we want to use for this is going to be f squared is equal to v naught squared plus two a delta y. Because okay, we're trying to find the change in y, we can rearrange that equation to this. And you can start plugging in values. So again, at the top of its path, uh, the final velocity is going to be zero, which is given there. Um, our initial velocity is 12 meters a second, and we're going to square that, and then divide by two times that negative 9.8 meters a second squared. So we end up with 7.3 meters. The last question is, how long does it take the ball to reach uh, a point 0.5 meters above its release point? All right, so we're not going all the way up to the top, but we want to know um, where it is five meters above the release point. So in this problem, we don't know its final velocity um, like in the first one. So we can't use that value. So we need to find an equation that lets us find um, the time um, given only its initial velocity and its position. And of course, we know its acceleration. It's going to be negative g. All right, so we're going to use this equation here, which is another of our kinematic equations. Oops. Okay, and they're just going to go ahead and plug everything straight in. So you have the 5 meters, which is the height that we're going for, the initial velocity multiplied by time, which we're trying to find, minus 1 half 
um, the negative, right? Because we have that negative is in there because of the negative g. Uh, one half 9.8 meters second squared and then t squared. So what we end up with is this quadratic equation. Now uh, you can use the quadratic formula to solve it or if it's simple enough you can factor it out. Um, since we have decimal here, decimals here we probably want to just use the quadratic formula. Uh, and just a quick reminder, quadratic formula uh, is going to be the answers are equal to minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. And when we solve that, we find that we get two results. We get a time of 0.53 seconds and a time of 1.9 seconds. All right, so there's two times. How can that be? Uh, well, we have to think about it. And let me move my head out of the way here. Um, so this is really not surprising because the ball passes through that 5 meter mark twice. Um, once on the way up and once on the way down. But since we only want the one on the way up, we're going to pick the first time. Uh, so the first time is going to be that 0.53 seconds. So that will be your answer. Okay. So let's talk about some integration for a little bit. Um, so again, when we're talking about these things, we're just kind of giving you um, how we're going to use them and the explanation will come later in your calculus class. Um, okay, so, so we say we start with, whoops, let's say we start with this equation. Now, if I wanted to take the integral of that equation, which is a derivative, um, to take the integral, we can rearrange it. So you have the dv on one side, and you have your acceleration with respect, uh, derivative of t on the other side. Now, if you take the integra integral of both sides, you end up with what they have here. All right, so you have this um, final velocity or some velocity at v1 is equal to some uh, or minus some initial velocity and that's equal to the integral from t0 to t1 of a dt which is our acceleration uh, times t. Okay so this integral here is going to give us the area under the curve. So if you look at um, over here at figure a you can see that the area under the curve of your acceleration first time graph. So notice we have a t naught here and a t1. So between t any two given times, you can find the area under the curve. And that's going to represent the change in velocity, right? Because you have the change in velocity here, and the area under the curve on the right side is going to be the integral. And now the same thing applies for our uh, velocity first time graph. So if you have a velocity first time graph, you can go ahead and use uh, this integral as the area under the curve, and that's going to be our change in distance. Okay, so let's go ahead and make some sense of this with an example problem. Whiplash injury commonly occurs in a rear-end collision where a front car is hit from behind by a second car. In the 1970s, researchers concluded that the injury was due to the occupant's head being whipped back over the top of the seat as the car was slammed forward. As a result of this finding, head restraints were built into cars, neck, uh, neck, yet neck injuries in rear-end collisions continued to occur. So in a recent test to study neck injury in rear-end collisions, a volunteer was strapped to a seat that was then moved abruptly to simulate a collision by a rear car moving at 10.5 kilometers an hour. All right, so this first figure up here gives us the accelerations of the volunteer's torso and head during the collision, which time began at t is equal to zero. All right, so we're getting it this time. And notice this is first curve is our uh, speed of the torso, or excuse me, our acceleration of the torso. And the second curve is the acceleration of the head. And we notice that they don't accelerate at the same rate. All right, so the torso acceleration was delayed by 40 uh, milliseconds because during that time interval, the seat back had <clears throat> to compress against the volunteer. Uh, so the head acceleration was delayed by an additional 70 milliseconds. So what was the torso speed when the head began to accelerate? All right, so we're trying to find what the speed of the torso was right here at this time, which is about 110 milliseconds. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is divide this into uh, multiple sections because uh, the shape that we have here isn't quite the easiest um, to simply do. Okay, so what I'd first like to do is create this first section we'll call A. 
second section we'll call B, and then this third section here we'll call C. All right, so in our section from 0 to 40 milliseconds, we know that the area under the curve is 0 because the line is flat against the uh, x-axis. All right, so our area, section A, is going to be 0. Now from 40 oops, to 100 milliseconds, which is milliseconds, which is our B area, Okay, it's just a triangle. All right, so the area of a triangle is just one half um, base times height. So we can go ahead and put in one half. Oops. Let's say the area of B is one half. Uh, we'll use the uh, bottom first, so it's 0 0.60 milliseconds. Well, let's go ahead and uh, convert, actually, let's convert that to seconds. So it's, it's 0 0.060 seconds. And then the height is going to be in terms of the acceleration, which is meters a second squared, and it's going to be 50. 50 meters a second squared. Okay, and when you solve that, you get 1.5 meters per second. So that's the area part B. All right, and then our last little bit is from 100, oops, from 100 to 110 milliseconds. And that'll be area C. And this is just a rectangle, so it's just one, uh, one side by the other side. So that's 0 0.010 seconds, converting to seconds, and then 50 meters per second squared. And that's going to be equal to 0 0.50 meters a second. Okay. So now we can take this value, this value, and this value, and add it together to find our change in velocity. That's our change in velocity. going to be our 0 plus 1.5 meters a second plus 0 0.5 meters a second. We know that v0 started at 0, so that's just going to be 0. So v1, which is our speed when the head starts to accelerate, is 2.0 meters a second. Okay, and that's all for this chapter.